to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in jude verse 3 jude said Though I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Jude verse 3. We welcome you today to our study of fundamentals of the Christian faith. Just as Jude said in the verse that we just noted, sometimes it's necessary for Christians to defend the Christian faith. And so today we want to consider defending some of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And we want to do that in a spirit of love and kindness. And we're so glad that you've joined us for our program today. We hope that you'll get your Bible, locate it, have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God as our authority in our study today. Friend, we want you to know, as we said, we're so glad that you've tuned in. And we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by members and individual congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church Jesus died for or the plan of salvation, Friend, you'll find people there who love God, who'd be happy to visit with you about any biblical subject. And here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? We have a wide variety of good Bible study material available on our website. We have audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, articles, just a good host of Bible study material that's all available free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, either as a digital download or a DVD or CD, we also make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll be happy to get that to you in the format you requested. And friend, we want to encourage you as we think about these ideas today, we want to encourage every one of us to make sure that everything we say and do is based on the Word of God. That's our motive and that's our emphasis at the Gospel of Christ. We want to ask the two premier questions that relate to this. In Jeremiah 37, verse number 17, an evil king asked a great question. Is there any word from the Lord? And friend, that's what we're asking today as we think about defending the faith or the same question Paul mentioned in Romans 4, verse 3. What does the Scripture say? What does the Word of God say on this subject? That's our, what's at the heart of everything we say and everything we do. And so when we think about the idea of defending the faith and controversy, let's begin with defining a few terms. What do we mean by controversy? Controversy is defined as a prolonged public dispute, a debate or contention, a dispute concerning a matter of opinion, contention, strife, or argument. It comes from the Latin word controversia or controversis, meaning turned in an op opposite direction. And so basically, you've got two differing ideas or people turned in their minds in a different direction, and that causes controversy. Why is it then that we sometimes don't like controversy? We usually have to disagree with somebody, and often that makes us feel very uncomfortable. You know, that makes you feel uncomfortable for several reasons. The fear of being disliked by others. Sometimes we make it a personal matter rather about the facts and the truth. And we make it so personal that if someone doesn't agree with us, we don't like that person. And so there's that fear of being disliked by others. We're afraid sometimes that somebody's going to get angry with us and we don't like anybody to be upset or angry with us. Sometimes it makes us uncomfortable because people 
may not have all the facts or the ideas on a certain subject, and so they're really not prepared to talk about that, and that controversy makes them uncomfortable. But sometimes it makes us uncomfortable because we don't think of controversy or standing up for something as an act of love. Think about it this way for a moment. Galatians 4 verse 16, Paul said this, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Friend, when we tell someone what the Bible says, when we open up the Bible and we look to what the Bible says, and although someone may not have known or, or agreed with that idea, when we open up to the Word of God and, and looked at that together, is that unkind or unloving to do that? No, that's loving and that's kind. Proverbs 27 verse 5 says, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. And so, as it relates to the idea of controversy, you know, sometimes there are things that cause controversy that really ought not to. Sometimes controversy doesn't have as much to deal with the facts as it has to deal with personality and other things. Let me illustrate. Sometimes rumors or gossip, they bring about unnecessary controversy. Friend, we need to do away with rumors and gossip and get all that put to the side. We don't want what we, we want to make sure we have all the facts and that we're not misrepresenting any idea. Other times, it, controversy occurs because of a failure to accept the facts. I may not like that. I may not want to change the way I think or the way I'm acting or something in my life that's happening. And so there's controversy because that conflicts with the way I'm living my life. Then sometimes life situations causes pride or prejudice to bring about controversy. This situation makes me uncomfortable, therefore I might avoid that or try to do, deal with it in a different way. But friend, whatever the cause, we need to deal with controversy in a scriptural and a right way. And so let's think about, as we think today, about defending the faith and about maybe there being controversy, is there a right way, a right attitude and a right motive to deal with that? And friend, there absolutely is. The main attitude that is needed in dealing with and defending the faith, contending earnestly for the faith, and dealing with controversy is genuine love. Do we love people when we do this? Do we do it out of love? Can they tell that we're trying to be kind and, and loving? You know, part of the problem is sometimes we're not kind. We're abrasive. We're uh, mean spirit. We can be mean spirited. We can get that angry. We want people to know we love them, even if we disagree. Luke 19 10, that's the attitude of Jesus. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Did Jesus ever have to disagree with anybody? Did Jesus ever say anything that was controversial? Did he ever have to rebuke anybody? Oh, he did on multiple occasions, very sternly at times. But he did it out of love. Friend, we want that love for people to be seen. John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Can all people know and see our love when we're defending for the faith? Hebrews 13, 1 says, let brotherly love continue. And friend, it has continued even when it comes to standing up for and representing the truth. We want to love our brethren and we want to love our enemies. Matthew 5, verses 44 through 46. You know, in the New Testament, Paul would speak of certain people as being enemies of the truth enemies of righteousness, and yet the Bible teaches we're to love our enemies, to do good to them, to pray for them, to do what we can to help them. And so what's the main attitude that's needed in dealing with controversy and defending the faith? Friend, we need a love for people's souls. Then I want to ask you to consider this with me. 
Another attitude or motive that's needed in dealing with controversy and defending the faith is we need a desire to please men, or to, excuse me, to please God above men. Look in Galatians chapter 1, and I want you to notice what Paul says on this idea in verse number 10. Paul says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? Listen to this. For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul, in essence, says, I got out of the, I'm not in the men pleasing business. If I were in the men pleasing business, I wouldn't be preaching what I'm preaching. To make everybody happy, I'd just stay with Judaism and my life would be going real, real good in essence. Paul says, I'm not in that business. Friend, we're not out to make people mad at us. We're not out to do harm. We're not out to be ugly or unkind. But above all else, we're in the business of pleasing God. And friends, standing for the truth pleases God. Paul said in Acts chapter, you know, we need the attitude of Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, when confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He didn't say, what would Gamaliel, what would the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees, what would my family and what would the tribe of Benjamin have me to do? No. Paul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Friend, an attitude we need in defending the faith is we need an attitude of seeking the truth first. There's a passage I always think of when it comes to defending the faith and standing up for the truth. In Proverbs 23, verse 23, the proverb writer said, Buy the truth and sell it not. Friend, whatever cost there may be associated with truth, we need to attach ourselves to it. We need to buy that and use that in our lives. Why? For the reason Jesus said, John 8, verse 32, you'll know the truth and watch the result. Truth will set you free. You do not become somebody's enemy by speaking the truth. John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, I want you to think about another idea with me that goes a long way in defending the faith. As I stand up for and as I defend the faith, Let's realize that kindness goes a long way in defending the faith. Proverbs 15, 1 says this, A soft answer turns away wrath. What kind of answer? Harsh, gruff, to the mean spirit? No, a soft answer. Uh, look in your Bible with me in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 32. What's the attitude a Christian ought to have? The Bible says, and being kind, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is kind. Love is not behave rude and is not ugly toward people. And so in dealing with controversy, let's have kindness as we deal with other people. But friend, part of the attitude is, I've got it had it, the attitude of the faith is worth contending for. Jude 3, listen to it again. Jude said, while I was very diligent, while I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, I just wanted to write to you about how good it is to be Christians, brothers in Christ. He said, I had to stop abruptly. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Listen to the reason why which was once for all delivered to the saints. Friend, I need the attitude of this faith is worth defending because it's the once for all delivered faith. This is God's final will and revelation. And the Bible says in Ephesians 5.11, we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And so the, the final aim and motivation that we want to mention today, and this has to be the motivation in everything we do, is the salvation of souls. That was Jesus' motivation, right? Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38, Jesus looked at the crowds and he said, Truly, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts, he'll send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus looked at those people and what did he see? He saw souls in need of a shepherd. Go into all the world, 
preach the gospel unto every creature. And so, friend, let's realize that at times, even though it may be considered controversial in defending certain subjects, we've got to stand up for certain subjects. Uh, let me give you some examples. There were times when Jesus was controversial on salvation. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus would clearly teach that not every plan and not every way of salvation is right. We've got to follow God's way and God's plan to make sure that we're right with Him. Listen to the words of Matthew 18 and notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said this, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Friend, there's the idea that, that anybody can become a Christian. It doesn't matter what you know. You've got to become like a little child. You've got to be submissive to the will of God, and you've got to do what God says to be right with Him. Not every way is right. Not every way is pleasing to God. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go down it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there are who find it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. Was Jesus, did Jesus take a stand for the oneness of salvation and only in Him? He absolutely did, and so did His followers. Acts 4 verse 12, Peter said, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can I be saved in the name of Allah or can I be saved in the name of, of Buddha or Gandhi or whatever it may be? Only name you can be saved in is the name of Jesus. Jesus was very clear. Even though that may be considered controversial, he stood up for and defended God's way of salvation. Friend, would Jesus be considered controversial by many on his teaching concerning baptism? He might be, but he stood up for truth and taught what was right. Listen to how plainly Jesus taught about the essentiality of baptism. Mark 16, verse number 16, Jesus said this, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus say, you've got to believe? and be baptized to be saved? Listen to what he said in John 3, verse 5. Unless, listen to, the, listen to the essentiality of this. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, if I'm going to be saved, I've got to be baptized. That may be viewed by many as controversial, but Jesus stood up for God's teaching on that, and so did his followers. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Baptism is for the removal of sin. Saul was told, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. By some, Jesus might be considered controversial when he defended God's parameters on worship. You can't just go out and worship God however you want and say in Jesus' name and think that's going to be okay. Jesus laid down some definites on how to worship God. Listen to John 4 verse 24. God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Friend, if I'm going to worship in an acceptable way, I've got to worship God. Can't worship anything else. And I've got to worship God in the right attitude and spirit, with my whole heart, soul, mind, and body. And I've got to worship God 
in truth. Well, what is truth? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I've got to worship according to the teaching of the Bible. If it's not found in the Bible, friend, I can't go out and just do whatever I want and worship and say, that makes people happy and so it's okay. It's got to be the way God wants us to. Matthew 4, verse 10, Satan said to Jesus, All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. And here's what Jesus said. You shall worship the Lord your God only, and Him shall you serve. I can only worship God, and I've got to do it the way God teaches. Friend, by some, Jesus might be considered controversial on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But he clearly defended God's teaching on marriage going all the way back to the garden. Genesis 2, 24. Uh, Jesus would mention that. I, I want you to look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 19 with me for just a moment. And I want you to see what Jesus clearly taught on this subject. Look in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 3. The Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read? He who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they were no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to Jesus, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, fornication, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. Friend, Jesus taught very clearly God's original pattern. One man, one woman for life. Genesis 2 verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One man, one woman for life. That's the original paradigm or plan on marriage. Jesus, they said, well, well, Moses commanded. And Jesus said, wait, 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 wait. Moses permitted you because of the hardness of your heart. But listen to this, from the beginning, it was never so. And then Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her, who's divorced for reasons other than fornication, commits adultery. And so Jesus clearly taught the only scriptural reason for divorce and remarriage was fornication, and then and only then do we find that the innocent party has the right to remarry. Is that uh, controversial to many people's thinking? Maybe. But Jesus taught that very clearly and defended the truth on that subject. And so as we think about these ideas, friend, even as it relates to, to moral issues, let's realize Jesus clearly taught what the Bible teaches on, on moral issues, on things like uh, abortion. Did the, does the Bible teach? Is, that may be a controversial subject to many, but is the Bible very clear on that? God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. What's more innocent than an unborn child? Matthew 18, Jesus said, Bring the little children to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25. If two men were fighting and they heard a woman who was and caused her to give birth prematurely and, and that baby died, what was the a penalty for that? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Listen to this. Life for life. How did God view the life of that unborn child just the same as the life of the adult male who killed it? Abortion is wrong. That's not right in God's sight. Friend, as we think today about defending the Christian faith, our hope and our prayer is that we'll want to buy the truth 
and sell it not. Proverbs 23, 23. Our hope and our prayer is this, that we'll speak the truth in love. Friend, the things we say today, they may be different. They may be deemed as controversial. They may be things that, that are not accepted even widely in, religious, in the religious world. But what we want to do is speak the truth in love. We're concerned about pleasing God, Galatians 1 verse 10, and we're concerned about the truth which makes people free. And so today we ask you to consider, have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Have you submitted your life to His will? Are you a Christian? I'm not asking, did you do what some man somewhere told you to do? I'm not asking, did you say the sinner's prayer or Put your hand on the t TV. You don't find those ideas in the Bible. Have you done what people were taught to do in the New Testament? They had to hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. They had to believe in Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. They had to repent of sin. Luke 13, 3. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. They had to confess the name of Jesus, Romans 10, verse 10, and they had to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Mark 16, 16. And so, friend, if you've not done that, we encourage you today, won't you become a member of the New Testament church? You see, in the first century, those who repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins, those who gladly received God's Word, Acts 2 verse 47 says, the Lord added them to His church. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, friend, we'd love to study more with you about that. If there are issues that you've been thinking about, you'd like to know more on what the Bible teaches on that subject, or if we can help you in any way, friend, contact the Lord's church in your area, in your area contact us, and we'd be glad to help you. And our hope and prayer is that you'll join us next time as we're going to study more on this great subject of fundamentals of the Christian faith. We're going to look to the Bible and let the Bible be our guide. And so join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the